Welcome everyone to the Hoover Institution Workshop on using text as data in policy analysis. We are delighted you could join us for our first show in 2023. My name is Stephen Davis. Justin Grimmer and I moderate the workshop and select speakers. Tara Mahan makes the show run smoothly and Kathy Campitelli keeps us organized. Today's workshop features a paper on immigrant narratives by Pai Gehring, Jope Adama, and Panu Padvera. Kai is at the VIS Academy at the University of Bern. Uh, Jope and Panu are at the IFO Institute and the Leibniz Institute for Economic Research at the University of Munich. Here's our format. The authors will present the paper over the course of about 30 minutes. Um, well, I think Jope will be doing that, I think. Then we'll turn to discussion and Q&A. If you have a question or comment, put it into the Q&A box. And depending on the flow, uh, we may combine questions, paraphrase, or ask you to state your remarks directly. We'll run for about 60 minutes. After that, we'll turn off the recording and continue with a more informal discussion for anyone who wants to stick around. Joe, the floor is yours. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to, to present my paper at your workshop. I think I didn't know the workshop before, and I think uh, it would have been nice to know. And I think you had some nice speakers that uh, work in also narrative um, narrative themes, such as um, uh, Peter Andre, who was there uh, in November or December, I think. And I think it's nice to kind of contrast uh, different approaches. And I think I will focus a bit more on the methodology, but feel free to ask any questions. So the project is called Immigrant Narratives, and the aim is really to, um, to study narratives throughout space and time uh, in Germany in the past 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so a joint work with Pano, who's here, and Kai Gehring, who's at uh, the University of Bern. Um, so the main motivation behind it is that immigration has become really a very polarizing issue in many societies in the past years, and especially so in Germany uh, during the large refugee wave. And a lot of people have tried to study, okay, what are the determinants about of, of attitudes towards migration and concerns about uh, immigration and xenophobia? Um, so in the economics literature, a lot of people have tried to look at, okay, what happens when um, immigrants come to someone's locality, do people um, update their attitudes? And this is kind of testing this contact hypothesis. So basically, do people become more favorable towards immigration and immigrants um, in their own country um, when they come into contact with people? And a lot of these studies find relatively small, small effects of a few percentage points. Um, however, this happened really during a wave which led to a large backlash uh, towards immigration in general, but also um, to far-right voting. And if you kind of compare these estimates from, from this um, contact literature to basically the huge surge in, um, in, uh, in negative attitudes towards migration, there's a lot we can't explain. Uh, and one obvious candidate, because attitudes started worsening already before the largest inflow of immigrants in Germany, is to basically look at what happens in media? Because media probably kind of informs people about what is about to happen. And I think um, this is, I think, so just to give a little bit of motivation, um, the, the attitudes towards migration really worsened a lot. So basically there's a question in the German socioeconomic panel, which basically asks, um, do you have large concerns, some concerns or no concerns about immigration? And basically the, the share of people answering uh, that they have large concerns um, uh, increased a lot. Um, so basically, we study narratives about immigrants in Germany, which is a, a, an interesting setting because of the large inflow of immigrants recently, but also because of the strong regional newspaper market. Um, and if we look at the economics literature, people have studied a lot of different aspects of migration. And the major one is, of course, uh, labor market effect. But if we actually look at surveys, uh, a lot of different aspects actually affect people's attitudes towards migration, such as uh, concerns about, uh, about, about culture, but also about compositional amenities, so schools and, 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 and things like that. Um, so basically, these newspaper articles also um, consist of these different themes, and we basically try to capture this with our methodology. Um, and to do this, we really take an approach which is quite different from other papers that look at narratives, because they look often at 
different phenomena and try to figure out how do people explain this and what do people find compelling explanations. Um, and basically, we set, we try to figure out which we we try to classify the narratives in broader themes and with what sentiment these themes are covered. And importantly, we do it at the sentence level because it's the smallest understandable uh, unit of text. Um, so we largely connect to this narrative economics literature, and I think. Um, so you might have heard the motivation already uh, uh, when Peter Ander was giving his talk, but basically one of the main motivations is that narratives do shape, but also reflect uh, society. So there have been a lot of papers that have kind of studied how narratives basically affect human behavior. Um, but often these studies really want to study a single aspect or a single narrative. And uh, nowadays, I think people try to kind of build a bit more comprehensive approaches. So basically these narratives about, for example, narratives about the macroeconomy, um, there's really kind of, we have a phenomenon and how do people explain it? Um, so as I said, we don't want to look at how, how a certain phenomenon, but we really want to look at how people, what narratives about other groups in the society um, prevail. So we want to study that. And we want to build a methodology that can do that relatively well, and that can do it on a large, uh, set of data because we have this regional component in Germany, uh, but we also want to really look over longer periods of time and with a high frequency as possible. So what we do is that we build a Texas data map, which is on one hand built on custom made dictionaries that fit within their themes. Uh, I will explain in a bit what themes we identified. Uh, and we combine this with several natural language processing methods that are available on the Python package was called SPACI, which allows for named entity recognition, negation in sentences uh, and other things, but we will come to that. And if you ask me, okay, why are you looking at regional newspapers? Well, Germany is a bit of a specific case compared to especially other European countries because there's a strong regional newspaper. So in some cities, um, the, the regional, the main regional newspaper really have has market shares uh, of more than 50%, which makes, uh, May, which allows for a very kind of fine grained component. And later, if we want to link up um, this to, for example, attitudes towards migration, I think that's very useful because we can kind of study what are the local effects of local coverage. And we do this on a set of 70 newspapers uh, from which we obtained more than 100,000 articles. And I think I will quickly skip over this because we connect to a lot of literature on attitudes towards migration, which especially has been prominent uh, in the past years. And it had been previously be really not the domain of economists, but more of the domain of sociologists and media scientists, which really did structured readings. And interestingly, we can also replicate some of the findings they find. So that, for example, seven specific immigrant groups are overrepresented um, in the media, as well as that there's interesting geographic patterns in Germany, which I'll come to later. Um, I just want to quickly mention that there's kind of two aspects that we want to contribute to in the economics literature. That's the determinants of regional news coverage. So there's a lot of papers that want to study, okay, how do newspapers actually and, and other media outlets, how they actually form these kind of, what kind of stories they publish and what is the demand of people for these stories. And another aspect of it is the effects of uh, coverage of media coverage about immigrants. So some people have studied uh, what is the effect of, of, of um, TV coverage on attitudes towards migration. And from a paper from France, uh, it has been found that basically the more the salience of the topic of immigration increases, the more polarized attitudes towards migration become. And some of you might have been, been uh, are familiar with the paper of Jolalova, which basically studies the, the ban by the Associated Press in the US uh, to use the term illegal immigrants. And they, she finds that this has strong effects on attitude towards migration and towards migration policy. So I will now dive into our method. So our method consists roughly of three main steps. So basically we obtain newspaper articles and then basically we go to the sentence level. And then at the sentence level, we want to determine is the sentence about an immigrant or not. So I basically need to have some kind of, um, of relevant keywords. So here we try to kind of um, show um, what kind of keywords we include. So it either includes a word from a, a specific dictionary, a foreign, uh, foreign name, or whether someone is from a specific country, or whether it contains a theme-specific 
words related to words migration. Um, and one of the things that we can do with the Python package Pacey is basically we can track pronouns throughout sentences. So basically when uh, sentence A talks about an immigrant, someone from a specific country, and the next sentence uses the pronoun he, we can basically uh, realize that the next sentence is also about uh, that focal person. And then as a second step, we basically want to use these theme-specific uh, dictionaries to basically classify the sentences that are about immigrants into specific themes. So here you see the five main themes that we identified. The first is economy, which we further subdivide in work, welfare, and entrepreneurship, which have very distinct, um, which are very distinct aspects uh, of migration, which uh, might be highlighted in in different newspaper articles with different uh, sentiments. The second is foreign religion, which are all foreign religions except for Christianity and Judaism. The third is cultural integration, which is about integration. Uh, it's, it's broadly about integration aspects, such as uh, cultural integration specifically, but also educational uh, integration, which is kind of distinct from the economy perspective. Uh, the fourth is uh, the immigrant criminality, which basically is crimes committed by immigrants. Um, and the last category is immigrants as victims, which is crime is committed um, against immigrants and other statements that are clearly anti-immigrants. Anti, anti so basically for each of these um, uh, five themes, we, identify, we, we construct dictionaries with words that are specific to the German context. Um, and I think this is a strong approach, but it's also very labor intensive. Um, and one thing that we do when we construct these dictionaries um, we asked arrays to basically to each of these uh, to each of these um, theme specific uh, words to basically assign a, a positive, a neutral, or negative sentiment, and that's our um, our third step. Um, and in assigning the sentiment, we really kind of abstain from using this kind of standard approaches, which are based on on keyword counting and and counting the sentiment of specific keywords. But we really want to. We, we really want to make sure that we have as little bias as possible. So for example, we take into account negation in sentences or we take into account weakening words. And I think with the Python package space, that's very well to do. And we really see, uh, and later that we will show our validation that we can do much better than traditional approaches. Um, so I would quickly want to kind of highlight the main reasonings behind why we chose this approach, because there's many approaches uh, around that kind of big data approaches of, of text, such as topic modeling or supervised machine learning. And I think one important thing that speaks for our method and against topic modeling approaches is that we define themes that we deem relevant to driving attitudes towards migration and in the broader sense of, of the economics literature on um, effects of immigration. But for example, some of these themes that we identify, such as entrepreneurship, are relatively rare. So if you would uh, do some topic modeling approach, uh, we would not get entrepreneurship as one of the, the main topics. Um, the second issue is that we look at sentences relative than articles. And if I have time, I can, can show you some descriptives later that the narratives conveyed at the sentence level are different from the article level. Um, so for example, um, foreign religion, is not very prevalent as the main issue of articles, but is prevalent in many articles that are about uh, other other um, main topics. Um, and I, 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 I can show you later if you want. Um, and then, um, which I've already mentioned, I think it is assigning sentiment um, uh, based on this very specific words, I think is very important. Um, and, and German is a specific case because there's a lot of composite words that would not show up in sentiment dictionaries, uh, but that we, uh, in our case, hard code. So that can be like engrams um, specific to, to, to migration, and we can assign specific sentiments to those. So the data set that we use uh, is the following. So we basically uh, use Factiva. We download newspaper articles from all newspapers available in Factiva, which is when you prevent double counting and uh, is approximately uh, 70 newspapers that you cover for at least the year 2019. Um, and basically we download articles that specify that that go through a certain filter. So there needs to be at least 
some term related to immigration or immigrants or foreigners, and as well, uh, a location in Germany. So we really want to capture narratives about immigrants in Germany, but not in other countries or potentially coming to Germany. Um, and because we have, uh, uh, we have uh, access to the university account, we basically have a limited sampling approach. So we downloaded uh, 1500 uh, newspaper articles per 10 year period. So that's approximately a newspaper art, uh, article every two or three days uh, for every newspaper. And then uh, we use make use of a data set called IVW, which basically allows us for each of these newspapers uh, to see how many readers there are in uh, each of the uh, 10,000 municipalities in Germany. So that's nice because then we can also link this regional aspect very well. So for example, we can, we can link narratives about immigrants to how many immigrants from specific immigrant groups are leave, living in these areas. Um, and in 2019, so the last year of our data, we have very good coverage. So we have at least one regional newspaper in uh, more than 70% of municipalities uh, and 45% of all sales. So we really capture uh, a large part of the regional newspaper market. So he, first I will just give a few descriptives over of the, the, temporal, uh, the temporal averages of how prevalent immigration is. Uh, the salience of specific narrative themes and the theme specific sentiments aggregated over all newspapers uh, in the data set. So we focus on a balance sample, uh, we, uh, we focus on a balance sample from 2005 to 2019 onwards. And I think this picture will not surprise many people. So basically approximately one and a half percent of all newspaper articles contained na uh, narratives about immigrants in Germany. Uh, but in 2015, this rose rapidly to, to almost 3% when uh, the refugee crisis started. And in all these articles that we have downloaded, we basically find that 9% of the sentences in these articles contain narratives about immigration. So we can assign them to each of those uh, themes that we have, to any of those themes that we have. And if we look at the, the, the pattern of these, the relative prevalence of these narratives over time, we basically get the following picture. So basically, you see basically the share of total narratives aggregated by month. And basically, what we see here is that um, in the early time periods, um, um, the, the, the narratives, uh, narratives about uh, foreign religion and cultural integration uh, dominate. And uh, this does not really change much over the whole time period. But we see that uh, during and after the migrant crisis, narratives about um, immigrant crime became much more prevalent. Um, and there's also some notable events uh, in Germany, uh, which, which show up as strong peaks in, in the theme share of, of immigrant crime narrative. Um, and for example, here, you see also a very pronounced peak in, in welfare concerns and in work concerns. That's when Romanians and Bulgarians were allowed to enter uh, the German labor market unconditionally. So that's J January 1st, 2014. And then we look at the, set, the set average sentiment. So basically we assign this positive, neutral or negative sentiment. And basically we can aggregate that up for each of the month and we can show it over. So if we look at the aggregated sentiment across all of these narrative themes, we basically see that the average is around zero, but becomes more negative during the migrant crisis. And if we look at the separate themes, we see basically that most of the narrative themes, the sentiment is relatively flat apart from two. So uh, sentiments about work have, have improved over time and sentiments about foreign religion have been worsened because there was also a large debate in Germany uh, about um, the immigrants being of Muslim background. And this is really, really visible in, in our results. And we see that sentiment in these newspaper articles worsened a lot. Um, and then I go on to the human validation. So basically, we build this approach, uh, and we basically build this theme-specific dictionaries because we had something in mind what these th themes convey. So basically, we we build up coding instructions for for human coders to code it in a way as similar as possible. Uh, so we hired sixteen uh, RAs, which were not involved in the first step of constructing these uh, initial dictionaries. Uh, and we give them approximately 1%, uh, we give them approximately 1% of our sample, uh, and we let each sentence be coded by four human coders. 
And one thing that we found when we, we gave these instructions to people is that basically the, and I think I can quickly show you that there was a large disagreement among human coders. Uh, what's, what um, narrative theme uh, specific sentence um, belongs to. So here on the left, we basically see the share of sentences classified. And as already mentioned, our algorithm, um, that's the cross here, identifies approximately 9% of all sentences as conveying one of these uh, immigrant narratives. Um, and on average, this is similar for the students, but some students code only two to 3% of sentences, whereas some other students code much more. So there's a large heterogeneity, and we see similar heterogeneity when we go to teams. However, we see that um, the cross here is always within reasonably within uh, the bound of the students. So basically, the classification rates per narrative theme don't differ uh, that much uh, between students and, uh, and, and our approach. And then basically, um, we do our approach and we can compare it to how a dictionary based approach would, would uh, perform. And we can kind of add these separate steps uh, that we do in our, our approach. So the basic thing that we do is basically just dictionaries. And then we basically see with only these dictionaries, we only pick uh, simple dictionaries with common migrant terms. We only pick 29% of the sentence that our final algorithm uh, picks up, but this get better when we add, um, add the dictionaries um, and the last step we add the pronoun function, which is able to track. Uh, in practice, we found the pronoun function was re relatively hard to use. And, and so only 2.8% of sentences that end up as classified about immigrant, uh, about a narrative about immigrants um, is, uh, contributed due to the pronoun function. And here basically on the bottom, we basically see um, how our approach does compare to a simple dictionary approach. So on the left, we basically see the share of sentences uh, that are correctly classified, where we use basically the sample where all four human coders agree as a ground truth. So basically our approach selects uh, almost 97% of sentences correctly, uh, whereas um, the dictionary-based approach picks up 87%. And if we then uh, look at what we call the complete misalignment rate, which is actually seeing how many sentences are picked up that are coded as not to be about narratives about immigrants by all four human coders, we basically see that uh, we only pick up two, a bit more than 2% of sentences, whereas a simple dictionary approach would pick up much more. Um, and this is maybe because there is some, so basically this could be able be sentences that are about immigration, but are not about any of the themes. So there's a lot of false counts. Um, and I think this kind of speaks for our method because basically uh, this is basic, you could consider this as a false positive rate. And if we look at the sentiment, uh, we also see that our approach um, does better. So here on the x-axis, we see the absolute deviation in sentiment. So the sentiment of minus one, zero, or one uh, of our human approach compared to the sample where all human uh, where all human coders agree on whether the sentiment is minus one, zero, or plus one. And basically, we see that we are correct in 67% of cases, whereas these um, dictionary-based approaches, uh, Santi WS and TextBlob, which are specific for German language, um, only uh, agree with these humans in a third of the case. So now I want to quickly turn to uh, a few applications which we can do with basically our data set that we constructed, right? So we can aggregate these um, uh, prevalence of, uh, of, of immigrant articles. We can aggregate um, what share of all immigrant narratives are about the specific themes and we have the theme specific sentence and we kind of can correlate that to, to specific factors. So first we just aggregate um, it up according to newspaper uh, broad geographic group. So we, we identified four, uh, four geographic groups. First of them is the five national newspapers. The other one is I think four newspapers that are based in Berlin and serving the Berlin market. Um, the rest of uh, newspapers that serve the rest of Eastern Germany and all the other newspapers, which is the biggest group that serve uh, the Western uh, German uh, newspaper market. 
And one thing what we see on the left, which is basically the share of articles about immigrants in Germany, we basically see that um, in the beginning, there is already a stark difference between those newspapers from former Eastern Germany to the newspapers from other groups, because they talk much less about immigrants. So um, approximately 0.5% of all newspaper articles are about immigrants in East region, East, East German newspapers, whereas this is almost 3% in the first period already. Uh, so this is 2012. And we see that this gap even widens a lot during uh, the refugee crisis, where 6% of articles in Berlin and national newspapers are about uh, immigrants in Germany, whereas this is still less than 2% in the Eastern German newspapers. And this is especially interesting if you consider that concerns about immigration are higher in Eastern Germany, measured by all conventional measures, such as this attitudes towards migration in uh, socioeconomic panel service. And so we kind of try to understand what, what else is going on here. And we basically, when we look at the relative prevalence, prevalence of narrative themes, we basically see that in the Eastern German newspaper, much more of the narratives are actually about the economy and much less are about foreign religion. Um, and if we look at the, the rightmost panel, we basically graph what happens to the average sentiment uh, in these four newspaper groups over time. And we also see that um, we also see that um, the average sentiment is not that negative during the migrant crisis in Eastern German newspapers. Um, this could, be, of course, be partially driven because um, narratives about work are much more positive on average than narratives about foreign religion. So basically, now we can go back or to a little bit finer level where we look at the newspaper level. So basically, every dot in this graph is a newspaper. On the x-axis, we see the local share of immigrants in the coverage area, so weighted by uh, newspaper readership of the respective newspapers. And on the y-axis, we see the share of articles about immigrants. And basically, the more immigrants are somewhere locally, uh, the more newspaper articles about immigrants. I think this is not a surprising finding. And if we are going to look at specific narrative themes, we find something similar. So basically, the vast majority of narratives about foreign religion are about uh, Muslim immigrants. Uh, so basically, if we correlate the share of Muslim immigrants locally, which varies, uh, so this is data from 2019, which varies from approximately 2% to 8%, where we define Muslim immigrants as foreign born citizens from originating from Muslim countries. Um, and we basically see that the more Muslim immigrants there are locally, the more prevalent narratives, the relative prevalence of narratives about foreign religion are. And here in this graph, you see uh, the red uh, denotes newspapers from the former Eastern Germany, the blue denotes newspapers from the former Western Germany. So basically, in terms of the, the number of immigrants, but also the number of Muslim immigrants, there's much less, much less immigrants in, uh, in former Eastern Germany. And that partially explains that there's more newspaper articles about, uh, about other themes. Uh, in these Eastern German regions. Um, and then I think I don't have that much time, but I think I will quickly go through this. So basically we are interested in what happens during the, um, during the migrant crisis. And I think there are several interesting events that we can identify. So on the upper left, we just see the total number of articles per month throughout all the articles that we have in a balance sample from 2012 to 2020. And we basically see that there are very, a few very uh, pronounced peaks. So for example, the labor market opening did not lead to much, many more articles about immigrants, but this peak in the beginning of 2015 coincides with when the, the refugee crisis really um, became apparent. There became groups against uh, like a group called Pegida, which was, which had a strong anti-immigrant sentiment, strong anti-Muslim sentiment, as well as the terrorist attack on Charlie Hebdo in January. And um, another event that we can identify is an event in Cologne during New Year's Eve of 2016. Um, and I think this is a very interesting event, first of all, because it was strongly geographically bound, but also because this really shifted people's uh, opinion about immigrants in Germany and led to a strong increase in in, uh, in narratives about 
um, about um, crime, but later also about foreign religion. And basically on the lower left, you can see how uh, the aggregated sentiment develops over time. And I think a few things become very clear. So the, the, in, during the start of the migrant crisis, there was a huge drop in sentiment, as well as in, um, in early 2016, during this New Year's Eve event, as well as in uh, the end of 2016, when there was a terrorist attack uh, in Berlin. And we can basically decompose this change in sentiment uh, into our narrative themes and our theme-specific sentiments. So we can ask ourselves the questions, okay, sentiments worsen, in what, what kind of dimension does this happen? So basically we can, we, we, we try to decompose this, keeping the share uh, of uh, narrative themes fixed as well as uh, the theme specific sentiments. And then we can kind of look what happened, what would have happened if, for example, the shares of narrative themes would have been fixed and the sentiment would have been worse. So basically we can kind of do a decomposition analysis. And we basically find that a large part, so these are the pink, the pink purplish bars here, a large part in the de of the deterioration of sentiment during the migrant crisis is driven by shifts between themes. So basically, themes that are more negatively displayed uh, become more pre prevalent, which is foreign religion in our case. So I think my time is almost up. So I will kind of conclude, but feel free to ask questions out about all the specific aspects that I've covered. So. One major thing that we do in this work is to really build a methodology that allows us to kind of study narratives about groups in society. Well, and the group where we are interested in because we're migration scholars are immigrants, uh, immigrants in Germany. And we try to apply this to a large set of uh, regional newspapers. And our main findings are that foreign religion and cultural integration, if you go to the sentence level, are really the themes that prevail. Um, and one surprising finding that we find is that we, what we try, what, which we, we try in later work to, to get it, to dive a bit deeper into is how, why newspapers uh, in Eastern Germany seem to talk less about immigration, but also talk more positively about immigration. And another thing is that we can basically use this data set to study how nationwide shocks are absorbed. So I, I haven't showed you before uh, now, but I can, I can show you later is that basically um, local conditions matter. So the more Muslim immigrants are somewhere, if a nationwide shock happens, um, there's a differential response of newspapers with a low share of Muslim immigrants compared to newspapers with a high share of Muslim immigrants. So this is still work in progress. So we basically kind of have several ideas which we would like to pursue, but I think uh, my time is up, so I, I can talk about that later in the discussion. Great. Thanks a lot, Job. Um, let, let me start with a few comments and questions. One <clears throat> basic uh, comment is it would be great to see an index that combines average sentiment with the volume of coverage. Uh, unless I missed it, you don't show that, but that's kind of, you go back to the very first picture you started with, uh, the evolution of yep. attitudes towards immigration among Germans from survey-based data. Presumably that is affected by a combination of coverage volume and average sentiment. It looks as if average sentiment is negatively correlated with volume, but it's hard. To, that's just what I infer from combining multiple pictures. Okay. So that, so that anyway, that that's just a basic comment. You can think about how best to do that. You can just take the product of volume and average yep. sentiment would be one idea. Um, second. You know, back on, I think there's more to be done with your human coders in a, in a few respects. First, you noted there's, there's a rather remarkable range of, of human classifications of just articles at the first stage. Are they about immigrant narratives or not? Yep. And then, you know, it was like 2% to 8% or something like that. Very, very wide range. Um, you know, one possibility is some some of your coders are really outliers and making errors at a higher rate than others. So I would I would just as a robustness exercise, I would compute each coder's average pairwise agreement where, with all the other coders, and I would drop the tails. I'd take you have like sixteen or twenty coders, if I remember right. So I just 
drop the two coders from each extreme. I guess, no, in this case, you just want to drop the coders who are who tend to disagree extensively with other coders, and then just redo your analysis. And do you, for example, get better performance metrics on your automated methods? So that's a very simple robustness check. Then a different point about your human coders, you, you, you sort of present things as the disagreement among coders is a bug of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, it can also be a feature and you could, you could use it to assess whether there's some, whether it's not, the error isn't on the human side, it's just that the, um, there's ambiguity in the actual language. And then you could try to identify what are the characteristics of ambiguous language. So one way to do that would be um, to construct for each sentence, the average pairwise agreement rate among the coders who looked at that sentence. And you have four coders per sentence as I understand it typically. You can construct the average, so you get, a, you, you get basically a metric of agreement among coders per sentence. And then you could take a number of approaches, but a simple one would be to try to uh, ask whether a supervised machine learning algorithm could replicate, could, could uh, do a good job, um, you know, test, test a test sample and then a performance sample in identifying sentences that have high disagreement rates among coders. If they can, that suggests there's something about the structure of the sentences themselves, which is ambiguous. And you could tell us about what that, uh, you know, what that ambigu ambiguous, you know, what are the characteristics of a sentence that gives rise to ambiguity in human readings? Okay, so, or, or it could be ambiguity or heterogeneity in readings. That's, you know, true heterogeneity. Oh. Politicians are often accused of trying to speak to multiple audiences in the same sentence with, you know, dog whistles or mm -hmm. coded language. So you have the opportunity, given that you've got four coders per sentence and thousands of these things, to actually try to characterize language that is either ambiguous or deliberately designed to send different messages to different groups. Maybe that's another paper, but you've got the raw material there to do that. Uh, and it seems worth exploring. So I'll, I'll pause there and see what see what reactions you have, and then maybe turn it over to Justin. So yeah, thank you very much. I think I think the last point is is, is actually very interesting. Something we haven't thought about. I mean, first we just saw this this huge disparity, and I think so. We gave them quite clear. We gave students quite clear instructions, um, but still we saw that there's a lot of variety. But I think it would be great to kind of look at. Maybe we can just simply look at kind of what words prevail in the sentences where two or three humans agree, one, two, three humans agree, but not all of them and not none of them. So I think that's a very good approach. One, you know, one aspect of what you mentioned, we can probably not do because we have very homogeneous group of people, namely university students. So I think it would be relatively hard to kind of see, okay, do different narratives, uh, are they, Judge differently by different people. I think that's unfortunately not what we can do. Um, well, related yeah, to the but you can still you can still make a start on that. You have about half of your coders are men, half are women. You can do see whether there's systematic differences between men and women. I think you said you have three immigrants among your coders. Yeah. Do they stand out in some way uh, in their classifications from the other coders? That's an easy thing to check. Uh, yeah. It's a small sample, but if if, if, if something noteworthy does emerge from that, then the next time you run an experiment like this, mm -hmm. you might want to deliberately select for uh, many immigrants uh, among your coders to explore it in a more um, effective way. Okay, I have one, one more issue. So this is actually something I, I did today, but uh, so basically we linked up our, our data sets to the German socioeconomic panel, right? And you asked, okay, what basically correlates to um, attitudes towards migration. So there's this three point question in the socioeconomic panel. Do you have large concerns? Do you have some concerns or do you have no concerns about immigration? That I, here I use about as an outcome group. And basically it's just a regression on the time series where we basically use the lagged value of the newspaper statistics. So basically 
the top is basically this percentage of articles about immigrants. And then we basically look at the different theme shares. So the omitted category is, um, is the economy theme share and the sentiments of, uh, of the narrative themes. And what we basically see here is that percentage of articles about immigrants is very strongly correlated to uh, concerns about immigration. But we also see that some of these themes, such as the foreign religion, cultural integration, immigrants as victims, seem to be somewhat negatively correlated, uh, seem to be positively correlated, negatively correlated with concerns about immigration. And also we see that when the economy, sentiments about the economy uh, become more positive, people uh, are more likely to, to state that they have concerns about immigration. Uh, negative story. So basically, I mean, from this graph, the correlation between the, the prevalence of articles uh, and attitudes towards migration is quite strong. But I, I agree with your point that kind of looking at this aggregate index or looking at the, uh, the interaction between total volume of negative sentences and the total volume of positive sentences would be kind of something sensible. So, I mean, in the end, we basically want to merge our data sets on a much finer level to the socioeconomic panel. So at the spatial level, where it basically can study, okay, those local coverage of newspapers actually um, correlate uh, to um, attitudes towards immigrants. Justin. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, definitely. Steve and I should have uh, crossed notes because uh, I wanna focus on the human coders as well. I'm gonna do my best not to repeat um, what Steve was saying. So. Uh, some of the analyses subset to where there's, you know, four coders to agree. And I just want to say that subsets to the set of cases where there is a sort of clear answer and, and very much building off what Steve said, I would really embrace the ambiguity here. I think that's a lot of, of what's interesting. And I would push it just a little bit further to think about, particularly with the sentiment classification, just as an example from American politics. I forget who said it, but there was a political figure who said something like, if this immigration continues, there'll be a taco truck on every corner if, if a Democrat gets elected. And that was meant to have a negative sentiment, but I, I think many of us thought <laughs> it sounded awesome. And you can imagine <laughs> this sort of variability is a thing that you almost want to embrace in the measure. So if there's a development, that development elicits very different reactions from different components of the population, uh, that would have a lot of... Um, Measuring that would have a lot of importance for understanding the effect of these narratives, but also for, you know, what's being conveyed in, in the reader's experience. So I would almost push you to see if you could identify these sorts of um, ambiguous uh, sentences from the coders and then almost run a, something like a survey experiment or a survey where you elicited reaction from a larger population and see how that variation differed by, I would think, in, attitude towards immigrants as reported in the same survey. I would be very interested in carrying out Steve's idea about using some sort of procedure to identify what is it about that sentence that you could then map in to get a sense of what that variation is. Because to me, that, that's where a lot of the interesting uh, parts of the debate pop up. Some folks embrace immigration, other folks don't. So the same sentence about an individual starting a business could be met negatively or positively. And I don't think we want to average that out because the point is that that variation um, in, a, in a much more last thing I'll say, much more sort of mechanical, just thinking about uh, disagreement, agree 100 percent on calculating, you know, pairwise intercoder agreement. That's a, a thing you definitely want to see. If you look at the sort of um, these underlying themes from the immigrant class classification, there's all it seems like there's always someone who's at the tail. And I'm just a little worried about someone, uh, maybe there's a different coder for every category who kind of gets fixated on it. And that happens a lot with coders. And that would be a thing I'd want to investigate. So someone could have relatively high agreement, but still be in, uh, an outlier just because they get fixated. And I would want to dive into that just a little bit more to, to know what's going on with that coder. So, yeah, no, I mean, we, I mean, we have looked into this, but we do, I mean, our focus was really to kind of build this kind of aggregate measures that we can then see what happens through the whole, uh, in the whole German debate. But I, I think the point related to this, so we looked a little bit at this um, intercoder agreements. Uh, I mean, we don't really, I mean, we, ha it's, it's a bit limiting because four coders is not that much. Uh, 
but we don't see that there's coders that stand out that much in terms of of classification but mostly in the propensity to to classify so i think there are some coders that classify 20 percent of sentences but they classify a lot of all of the things so they kind of have i i'm, I'm not so sure how to kind of understand this because some people just yeah. when they had saw something vaguely related to 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 culture they they, they flag it while others only flagged it when there was super explicitly said this is uh when it's about a cultural aspect or even the explicit word mention of the word culture. Mm -hmm. Um so I, I think I think this is an interesting aspect. And I I I I really kind of yeah there there can be very interesting things in this. But we have looked at it for now to a very limited extent, but I think it will be nice to be seen. Great. Thanks. Uh, hey Tara, uh, Elizabeth Elder has a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you're a little bit soft, Elizabeth. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll speak up. So uh, thanks so much. I have a kind of um, applied question. I, I'm interested in this pronoun function you mentioned. It's not something I'd come across before. Uh, and I was curious about the fact it didn't seem like it maybe added too much to your predictions. You said maybe it was a little bit messy. So I'd love to just hear a little more about where you land on that. Um, you know, why do you think it might have not, uh, not added that much to your predictions? And do you think that still that method is um, worth worth doing in, in analyses like this going forward? Yes, thank you very much. So I I have to disappoint you on one part because our third co-author um, is really a specialist on the use of of, of spacing, but. Um, I, I can quickly, you know, so you can kind of try to set the sensitivity of, of the propensity to, 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 to select a pronoun. And this is, I, I'm, no, I'm also not sure. So this is specifically for German language and uh, people have cross-checked these methods. So I think for English, it actually works better. Um, and our method only, uh, we found that it only selected the most you know, accurately the, the most relevant, the pronouns that are most obvious. And sometimes, so German has maybe a little bit more complicated sentence structure during English. So more complicated sentences, it didn't really pick it up. And I think this, this is really a limitation, especially when you have these, what we saw that we have these kind of more like human interest uh, based newspaper articles, when after they introduced the focal person, they don't talk about this fo focal person explicitly anymore but we refer in pronouns so this sometimes makes it a little bit hard to 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 capture this um i, I think there is potential to this but i i think that in our method it works okay because we add more sentences that we found to be relevant um but it's not that much sentence and especially when we just kind of looked at the articles that are really these kind of human interest articles there were a lot of sentences that our method did not classify um, we looked also what the humans did in that case, and we see that some humans picked it up well, but some humans, and it might also be partly in attentiveness, did not do so. So I think there's actually in specific types of newspaper articles, that kind of room of improvement using pronoun functions. That was that was helpful. I, I could imagine that this, the usefulness of the pronoun function might vary a lot across with writing style, including possibly between German and English. For, as you suggested. But let, let, can I ask you about your immigrants as victims category? Yes. Um, I was a little, uh, you didn't talk much about it in the talk, but I was puzzled by it. Mm -hmm. Your discussion in the paper, it seemed to, maybe I misunderstood, but it seemed to combine two very different concepts. One, that immigrants were sometimes victims and it was put in a way that, as to perhaps foster sympathy for immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, but some of your criteria for inclusion in that category also seem to encompass um, people just making negative remarks about immigrants in a way to not elicit sympathy for immigrants, but, but to actually elicit hostility or anxiety about immigrants. They, they both seem to be in this category, or did I misunderstand what you're capturing? So maybe you can just just first tell us how you how you captured uh, sentence how, how you classified sentences into this category and whether my characterization of what your method is doing is correct. 
Yes, I, I first of all, I completely agree. Uh, this is a weakness. So when we did this approach, so basically we really at initially want to keep these things separate. So basically uh, using the natural language processing tools, we kind of, for all the crimes, we want to figure out who did what to whom. Uh, and if the the person who is subject of the crime, we it's uh, it's uh, if the victim is the immigrant, then we basically kind of want to capture that team. We figure we figured out that this works relatively poorly, um, and we decided so basically among these sentences that are about immigrants as victims and um, things that are more explicitly related to anti-immigrant statements or discrimination whatsoever, then basically these sentences are much more prevalent. So basically, this is something that we want to improve upon. And that's why we also, in, in most of the analysis, which goes into for sentiments, for example, we don't talk too much about uh, immigrants as victims. But I completely agree. These are two distinct things that could really very differentially drive attitudes towards migration. And, and, and one aspect is maybe just kind of reflecting what happens. Uh, and the other one, namely statements about immigrants, is really the societal response in the sense of what is being written in newspapers. And yeah, I think, I think this is hard. Um, we should so I, improve I take on it, this. I take it from what you say that currently this category is not really fit for you, for purpose, right? It's so it, it includes both these victims, things. That you, but it's yeah. conflated with something else. Yes. I mean, so, I mean, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think in terms of discrimination about immigrants, maybe immigrants as victims is not the correct term. Okay. Perhaps if I can add something so that uh, uh, this, uh, so that first of all, I, I should highlight that when we calculate aggregate sentiment, when we do not include immigrants as victims so that the problems from that category do not carry out to the analysis on aggregate sentiment. Uh, uh, but I would defend the term somewhat so in the sense that this is uh, capturing how a society uh, treats immigrants or responds to immigrants. So even for it combines both crimes against immigrants and discrimination, it is still something which is uh, interesting and I would say also informative. Although I do agree that it does combine these two different things. Yeah, no, no, I'm not. Yeah, getting at the the underlying concepts is, I agree, is quite interesting. It just seems like, yeah, I think we're in agreement. There's there, there's two very different concepts that are currently captured in this category, and and I guess you gather you're working to figure out how to disentangle them. Do you have a, a sense of the amount of editorial discretion within a region? Um. And so you you can imagine, you know, so like what's going on here, there's like events that clearly were driving coverage and basically newspaper feels obligated to cover, you know, these high profile events. But other times there are stories that's just about how you assign your reporters, whether you're assigning a reporter to the, you know, police beat to see who's being arrested vis-a-vis -vis like who's opening businesses. And you know, you do have this interesting regional variation. I was cu curious, sort of, you know, within the region, are you seeing a, a pro or anti-immigrant newspaper pop up? Yeah. So there, there's huge vary. So I, I think there's there's a lot of variation across newspapers. So there's this typical tabloid newspapers which are much more negative about immigrants. And I think one thing that you're hinting at is okay. To what extent are newspapers just covering the bigger news or what do they kind of put into their own effort, right? I mean, one way you could potentially look at this is to look at articles in different sections of newspapers. So if you go to opinion pages or editorials or newsletters, letters to the, the newspaper, I think that would be actually very great to identify because then you also see a bit more, a different margin of how newspapers want to cover uh, immigration and with Factiva database, unfortunately, for some newspapers, there's identifiers in which sections newspaper articles appeared, but for many, there's not. And I think this would be very interesting to see. Kind of so, so when we showed this picture of newspapers in Eastern Germany are much more positive, 
a lot of people said, okay, this is some kind of a, a backlash of, of journalists against, um, against a, a, a large negative trend in, in this Eastern German society towards, uh, towards immigrants. And I think it would be very great to kind of be able to look at, to, okay, what is the discretion of, uh, of the editor? Um, and I think this kind of newspaper session would be a very interesting way to look at into this. Um, one way that we do have is maybe to kind of see the locality of the newspaper article. So basically, if the locality of the newspaper, if it mentions places that are in the coverage paper of the newspaper, and there we basically see that these articles across the board are much more positive. Uh, so I think there's the different ways we can kind of look at what newspapers uh, just take from, say, newspaper agencies and what they basically actually produce themselves in content. In a, in a similar vein, it would be useful to just rank newspapers by their average sentiment, mm -hmm. uh, the average sentiment of their articles about immigrants, and then take that as something you want to try to explain, not just in terms of location, but also the characteristics of their readership, yeah. the known political orientation of the newspaper, and so on. Uh, at least in the at least in the U.S., I don't know if this is true in Germany. News, newspaper outlets differ greatly in their willingness to say negative or the propensity to say positive things about immigrants. I I don't know. Is the same thing true in Germany? It'd be good to document that and and quantify it. Um. So so I think one thing is very different. So there is some newspapers that are single newspaper. Covering, so I think, first of all, it's very nice to look at the determinants of this. I think we should do this. The lack is a little bit of, we have a little bit of lack of, of information about, say, political stance. And one reason behind this is that these local newspapers are really kind of focusing on delivering local news. And basically, that makes them kind of not mm -hmm. completely apolitical, but we basically, but, but many of them cover are the single cover of a market. So I might expect that they want to kind of be around the median voter. Um, what we do see is that the most positive and the most negative newspapers in our data set are both newspapers that are actually in places where there is more competition. And I think this is kind of interesting and something we want to explore. So currently we have the 65 regional newspapers, um, which is like, 40% of the bit bigger regional newspapers. But if we get the whole, I think from some other newspaper databases, we may be able to get um, almost all regional newspapers. And I think then we can nicely study this kind of newspaper market story uh, about the determinants of towns mm -hmm. against and towards immigrants. Yeah, that'd be useful to do. Okay, any other comments or questions, Justin or anyone else from the floor? If if not, I'll let I'll let you wrap up, and then we'll uh, turn the, I'll turn off the recording and go to the informal session. Any final words, Joe? Um, no, I mean thank you very much for for the comments. I think these have been very useful, especially the the aspect of the the interhuman coder. I mean that's not our aim, but I think there's quite interesting uh, things to look into there. Okay, thank thanks you so much. much. This was this was super interesting. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and uh, look forward to seeing how this work progresses. 